Hey, I'm Rachel Hildebrandt from Partners for Sacred Places. We're a national nonprofit dedicated to the sound stewardship and active community use of our nation's sacred places. And from time to time, we offer webinars like this that have educational value for our constituency congregations. A um, couple of housekeeping notes. Please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. There are only 11 people here right now, so go ahead, make yourself known. Um, and also we want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have a question at any point during the session, just go ahead and type it into chat. I'm gonna be monitoring that the entire time. So I will let Austin and Greg know if you've entered a question. Um, before we start, I just wanna tell a story that kind of frames why we're doing this and why we believe in this. Um, so I've been with Partners for Sacred Places for about 10 years now. And a few years ago, I was asked to be on a team of folks who are helping a congregation figure out how to get out of a pickle. Um, so what had happened was this congregation in Philadelphia on a prominent commercial corridor was doing roofing work. They were doing it in a slow piecemeal manner because like many congregations, they don't have an endowment, they don't have reserved funds. So they were paying for the work as they were able to and doing it in a slow manner. So a storm comes through leading to roofing materials ending up on the property around the building and on the sidewalk. Next thing they know, somebody in the neighborhood calls the Department of Licenses and Inspections. Um, L and I, for short, they come out, they look at the building and they discover that in addition to what people saw with the roof, a wall was leaning and was unstable. So the congregation at that point was told that they cannot worship in their building um, until that's corrected. So that's when this team of people was assembled to try to figure out how to help the congregation out. And by the time that I became involved with this, um, I was like, I wonder if they have filed the claim because I've worked with these guys, Austin and Greg in the past, and I know to listen for certain key terms and to foster connection, if that makes sense. So that was my intention there. Um, so I'd find out that yes, they're in touch with the insurance company. They're not working with an adjuster. However, they're just dealing directly with the person who represents the insurance company. They had a friendly relationship with that person. They trusted that person. I mean, in the meantime, they hired an engineer to create a report kind of summarizing the condition of the building and then creating a path for fixing the wall. That report, I had a chance to look at it, kind of low key dissed the quality of the work they were having done and probably more importantly, attributed the, the wall to deferred maintenance or wear and tear. And the congregation, not realizing what they were doing, sent this report over to the insurance company, which then denied their claim, leaving the congregation in a really, really bad spot. Um, and they ended up having to worship somewhere else for about three years before getting back into their building. And so I think that just kind of underscores the importance of the work that these guys do and the reason that we're putting this on. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Austin. Thank you so much, Rachel. And um, we, we're, we'd like to thank Sacred Places for also giving us this opportunity and platform um, and to, to, to present you know, what hopefully is an educational takeaway for how to approach these insurance dilemmas that you might face as a as somebody that heads a sacred place, as somebody that might be involved in, um, you know, your congregation or in your sacred places, uh, overseeing the property damage, this is in large part a counterintuitive process. Something that um, Greg and myself, uh, Greg, my business partner, who's also here tonight, are going to speak about something we feel passionate about. And about eleven years ago, we started a firm based on, uh, you know, our our, our dealings with insurance companies and really just seeing that they would make their insured jump through several hoops and you know just just to try to collect on what they're entitled to under the insurance policy. So this is something advocating on behalf of uh, insurance uh, insureds such as yourselves uh, and and particularly advocating on behalf of, of sacred places to get them what they're entitled to under. The terms of their policy, something we feel strongly about again. And uh, just to introduce myself brief, briefly, Greg and myself, like I said, uh, we're both attorneys. And uh, I'm actually a 
licensed public adjuster, and uh, we are both uh, appraisers and licensed umpires. And that is, those are some terms that I'm going to explain to you because it's important to know really the difference be, between the three. Um, everybody knows what an attorney is, but a public adjuster is a person, and this is important because you, you hear this term when you're dealing with property damage. A public adjuster is an individual who is um, an expert in sh insurance policies and they advocate on behalf of the insured. That's the insurance policyholder. Um, they're able to tell you what your coverage is. They're able to negotiate in some states on behalf of the insured, and they are able to try to get you a settlement. Now, I say in some states because it really depends on uh, what um, state you're in, uh, when the law, how the law applies to what exactly a public adjuster can do. Uh, for example, in Louisiana, a public adjuster cannot negotiate with um, insurance companies. Instead, attorneys can only do it there. So that's an important distinction, um, and, and it varies between state. Now, an independent adjuster, uh, an independent adjuster, and I use the term independent adjuster uh, with, with quotation marks, because this is a person that is hired by the insurance a company. So they already, the, the name is deceiving, but their, their interests are in line with the insurance company. They will go out, they will survey the property, and they will try to either, you know, ultimately, uh, didn't, you know, pay as little as possible or deny your claim if they feel it's appropriate. So that is an, an independent adjuster. And that's something we're going to be talking about throughout the presentation and why it's important to know that distinction and that they are not looking out for your interests. An appraiser is someone who is trained in determining the market value of the damaged property or inventory that you may have in your building, which was affected by whatever the pearl was, the loss. Um, and that's important because there's provisions within your insurance policy uh, and, uh, that allow for, in certain circumstances, triggering what's called an appraiser, appraisal. And a, an appraisal is when both parties will hire an appraiser to come up with an evaluation of the property and then present it to an umpire and an umpire is a neutral third party that the two appraisers uh, submit their estimates to and that will ultimately make a decision that's usually binding. Um, so that's important because unlike, a, 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 unlike a, a, a lawsuit where you have to file a civil action, this is something that you may be able to do um, depending on what your insurance policy states and it's a way you could potentially expedite the process. Um, so with that said, uh, moving on to the, to the next slide, and just, again, it's a, it's, we're, we're at a little of a disadvantage here as attorneys. We like to be able to see the people we're talking to and interact with them. So we, we do encourage, as Rachel had said before, for you guys to, if you have any questions, please put them in the, uh, put them in the, in the chat and we'll get to them uh, and we'll try and make this as interactive as possible. And in that vein, um, you know, we also uh, had included a poll, a, a poll for you guys that uh, it, it is going to come up. It should be coming up within your you having signed on. I'm not sure if you guys can see that, um, but if it is, but once it is, let me know. Um, also, it doesn't look like the poll is going to come up. Oh, okay. Okay. So we had one for you guys just to see, get a feel for where it was that you were located for a feel for whether you had ever had the misfortune of having to deal with property damage before, whether you have any opening claims pending. Um, but that being said, you know, the, the focus today is really going to be when should you as a, as a sacred place, as a house of worship, when it is that you should seek help. And the question, the, the real answer is before, uh, during, and after a pearl event. So how how can you how can you uh, get help before? Well, one of the most important things to do is to note and to be familiar with your insurance policy. This means potentially reaching out to your broker. Not all insurance policies are created equally. Uh, it's good to know what provisions you know and what kind of coverage you have and the amount of coverage you have for each event. Some people assume they're covered for things that they're not covered for. So that is something that you really should be 
familiar with your insurance policy ahead of time. That's something that uh, an attorney can do for you. They can review your policy, your broker can do for you. They can review your policy and give you an idea of what it is um, and what it is you're covered for. You know, it's a lot of this legalese, a lot of it's counterintuitive and a lot, people aren't gonna necessarily sit there and read through it. And even if they do, they might not know what they're, what they're reading, but the broker and attorney should break it down and be able to tell you quite simply where you're covered and how you're covered. Obviously during a storm, uh, you know, one, one of the best things that you could do, uh, and I use storm, this is one of the pearls that you're covered for in your insurance policy, is to prepare for events, really to prepare for them in advance. Um, that's important and to have a, a system in place and a checklist in place for what to do during a weather event that you can plan for. Because sometimes we have the ability to plan for weather events, especially hurricanes, if we know they're coming. And finally, and this is the, the point we're going to be driving home tonight, is to know is, is afterwards to really make sure that you get the right uh, people to advocate on your behalf. Um, and that means, you know, documenting, identifying and documenting the pearl, the damage to your property, and then and really having the right people come up and, and help you out. Uh, so like I said, here's a, here's a roadmap in the slide of what we're gonna be covering, identifying claims. That is when we say identify, we're gonna go over what is typically covered under an insurance policy and you know, speak a little bit about each topic. But when we say identify, we also mean it's important to document, to, to, very, uh, to, to expeditiously document where possible these events. Um, you have damage to your property, take pictures, take video, um, and to have people come in and, and, and realize that you are covered. Advocacy, that's part two, that is going to be to advocate for, for sacred places. Um, when, when is it that you, and what, why is it that you really should get an attorney or a public adjuster to evaluate claims for you and work on claims for you. And finally, section three, the last part we're gonna go over is how, what the process looks like and how it is that they are able to maximize value um, and get you the recovery that you're entitled to under the terms of your insurance policy. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Greg to speak to you a little bit about some of the pearls that I was speaking about. Thanks, Austin. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Greg Littman. Uh, as Austin said, I, I am an attorney. Uh, also, I am a licensed appraiser and umpire. Um, I can't see anyone. We're, we can't see your faces. So uh, I don't know. We don't really know uh, if you're liking what we're saying. If you have questions, please, please, please um, put them in the chat. I'm, if you see me looking to my right, it's because I'm looking at my other screen, uh, which has the chat on there just to uh, making sure uh, I'm not missing something. Uh, so please, anytime ask questions, uh, we're happy to answer them. We wanna make it as interactive as, as we can on, on Zoom. So I wanna talk about some common damages that, that we see. Uh, and this is probably the most common damage we see, which is damage to roofs. Um, and uh, specifically wind damage, which is a covered event under 99.9% uh, .9 of insurance policies. And I, I really like this picture uh, from a, a nerdy attorney point of view, because you look at it and you think about, okay, what needs to be repaired? Is it just the eight or so shingles uh, that we need to replace and, and uh, tack on there? Um, will those new shingles match the existing roof? Uh, are they even available? Uh, do they still make them? If they make them, are they going to have the same patina? Uh, and is that okay just to put on, you know, brand new slate shingles next to shingles that have been weathered? Um, maybe that whole section there, I don't know if you can see my mouse, maybe that whole section there needs to be replaced, uh, or maybe the whole roof needs to be replaced. And then you kind of take a deeper dive. What about the, um, the sheeting that's under there? Has that been affected? Uh, was any of that pierced? Has there been any water infiltration? Um, and those are all things that you know I think about because I've, I've been doing this now for a while. But when the insurance company sends a quote unquote independent adjuster out there, what they are trying to do, and I'm not saying that they're doing something wrong or they're bad people, but they're trying to minimize the claim. I mean, that, that's their job. They're hired by the insurance company and 
insurance companies make money by collecting premiums and uh, paying out as little as possible. And I don't care if it's church mutual or a religious uh, affiliated insurance company, they're not your friend. Um, they're, they're there and some of them do a really good job and uh, they'll really go out of their way to help people. But it really depends on who comes out. Uh, what are their qualifications to look at this and say, okay, well, your policy covers matching. So therefore we have to match this patina. And maybe that could be done. Maybe we don't have to replace the whole roof, but maybe we can take some photos and give it to you know the stonemason and maybe they can chemically treat it so it looks the same. Or maybe they can't and the whole thing needs to be replaced. So just you know something to think about. Um, and uh, moving on to another common damage, and this goes hand in hand with uh, the previous slide is water sorry, damage. Just to, just to say, that's the difference between uh, you know, a few thousand dollars and tens of thousands of dollars on a, on a roof. So it can really make the, the, the difference between, I mean, those roofs are huge. It can be, it, we've had roofs that have been replaced that are hundreds of thousands of dollars in expense when they have to take off the entire roof and replace it, which you may be entitled to. So uh, as you can see here, um, you know, th this particular sacred place suffered uh, extreme, oh, excuse me, suffered extreme water damage uh, that took place over a long period of time. And this could have been a, a, a trickle in through the roof uh, that just, you know, they just left it alone, put a bucket there and, and said, look, we can't afford to do it. Um, and it just got worse and worse over time. And I, I like this photo too, because um, it demonstrates, at least to me, there's, there's something in a, an insurance policy that people may not know about. And then this is in every insurance policy. And it's the duty to mitigate your damages which means you have to prevent the damage from getting worse. So a simple thing, tarp the roof. Uh, it's a very uh, low cost event. You don't have to replace anything. Tarp the roof to prevent further uh, water infiltration. Board the windows, something like that. Uh, if you do not, and we've seen this time and time again where uh, a pastor may be too busy and just say, yeah, it's a little leak. I'm just going to throw a bucket there. It's no big deal. I don't really want to deal with the insurance company. You know, that little leak uh, over months, over years, uh, turns into a bigger problem. And now you're going to have rot, you're going to have mold, and the insurance company is going to come in and they're going to deny your claim because they're going to say, A, you didn't put us on notice of this claim. And B, you didn't mitigate your damage. You didn't, you, you are the cause of it getting worse. Uh, therefore, we're not paying for any of it. So uh, really something really important with water and water is a covered event. Um, pipe break, pipe freeze. You know, we also see this a lot. Uh, we just had a, a, a very large loss where uh, the pipe froze in the basement and ruined everything down there. And, and one of the, uh, the key arguments that the insurance company who denied the claim is they said, well, you, can, you can you prove that you purchased these units or, or this, this inventory? And by the way, the insurance, the insurance policy doesn't require you to prove that you own something. Um, and this guy did have proof, but the proof wasn't good enough for the insurance company. Uh, just like Austin, Austin said, the, the hoops that insurance companies make people jump through. Not all the time, but a lot of the time, uh, they're very burdensome and they're, de they're designed to frustrate people. They're designed to, uh, we'll get into this later, but they're designed to uh, drag out the process and they're designed so that the insurance company, if they're gonna pay out and they know they're gonna pay out, they wanna keep that money as long as possible because they're earning interest from it. Um, Okay, I'm just looking at Mark's comment right now. Thanks, Mark. Um, so uh, anyway, the, the, the pipe break, water freeze, is, this could happen little by little, the trickle situation that I was talking about, or it could just be a blowout like the, the pipe in the basement. Uh, either way, they're both covered events. Uh, another, uh, another one, fire. Um, and I have some statistics here I'm gonna read out. The National 
Well, does anyone have any idea of, uh, we'll ask this question, you can put it in the chat. Does anyone have any idea what the most common cause of fires are in religious institutions? Anyone? Anyone have any guess? You got candles and electrical. Yep. We'll close it off in a second one. Any, anyone else? All right, so the majority answer is candles. And actually that's what I thought it would be too. It's not. Candles only uh, account for 4% of fires in religious institutions. Um, the uh, number one cause uh, of, of fires is cooking equipment. Um, that, is, that is the number one cause of, uh, of fires. Uh, then we have electricals about uh, 10% and then the candles 4%, as I said. But uh, here's a staggering statistic. From 2007 to 2011, an average of 1,780 fires occurred on, a relig on religious and funeral properties each year. So that's each year that uh, these sacred places are, are being damaged. Fire is a covered event. Um, one of the things that you may not think about during a fire, and this is why and we'll get here, and I'm kind of speeding through this so we can get to the good stuff, but while you want a qualified uh, advocate. And when I say advocate, whether that's a public adjuster, whether that's an attorney, whether that's an engineer, sometimes you need all three, maybe an architect, um, is because you may see some of this fire damage and think, okay, well, we're going to fix this, this part of the building that was damaged by fire. But what about the rest of the building that was damaged by smoke? What about the smoke that seeped through the walls? The soot, does it need a chemical scrub? Um, if it's drywall, does the drywall need to be painted or does it need to be replaced? Uh, these are things that, you know, the average Joe is not thinking about. Uh, and these are things that the insurance company doesn't want to pay for. And a lot of times, unless you ask, unless you know to ask, they're not going to pay for it. Uh, tree fall. Um, this is one of my personal favorites. The uh, quick personal story, the first day of the pandemic. Uh, last March or two Marches ago, I, it, all, it all blends together. Uh, the first day my wife and I were working from home, a, a tree fell, hit my house, knocked out our power and our cable. And that, that's how we started 2020. Uh, so this is, this is one, of my, one of my favorites. I quickly cut down every single tree that was anywhere near my house. But uh, questions about trees. Trees are generally a covered event, but you have a duty to maintain. So if you have an old tree that's, uh, that's by your um, sacred place that is looking dead, hasn't been maintained, um, and you have, you know, if branches have been falling, they'll have deemed that you're on notice and that you haven't done uh, what you need to do to maintain the property. And that can cause a denial. So it's something to keep in mind. Also, if you have a neighbor that has a tree, uh, depending on what state you are in. For instance, in Pennsylvania, if your neighbor has a tree, you need to write them a letter and you need to write them a certified letter and put them on notice that the tree is a fall hazard, that it is encroaching onto your property and you're worried it's going to fall. Because if, that, if, if they're not on notice of it, um, it's not a covered event. Their, their uh, insurance company uh, does not have to pay for it. They're not responsible for it. And depending on where it hits on your property, it, it may be, it may not be a covered event or it may not be a full covered event. Flood, I don't know. Uh, I saw some people from, from Galveston, from Texas. Uh, I know that they're probably familiar with this. Uh, Hurricane Ida hit the Northeast uh, a, a few months ago. I mean, we, we had flooding up in the Philadelphia area that, you know, I, I've never seen and, uh, you know, hundred year floodplains. And uh, a thing that's very important here is chances are your average uh, commercial policy does not cover any flood. Flood is a separate policy uh, that needs to be purchased separately. So I would definitely, uh, depending on where you are, uh, I would definitely contact your broker, say, do we have flood insurance? If not, how much is it? And then, you know, do that risk reward ratio, you know, is it worth it? How often have we ever flooded? Um, 
and it's usually not too expensive, especially if you're not in a, in a flood zone, because, uh, you know, I have a lot of businesses that, that have contacted us after Ida, none of them had flood insurance because they weren't in flood, they weren't in flood zones um, and they've never flooded before. So just, just something to keep in mind, um, check, uh, check with your broker, see if you have it. Um, I want to turn it over to Austin. And if I'm, you know, if anyone has any questions, I know I'm kind of uh, speeding through this, but as I said, I want to kind of get to some of the results. I'm going to turn it over to Austin to talk about uh, one of his favorite topics, which is construction negligence. And I, I guess I would say that this is one of my favorite topics because we find that we're frequently arguing it. Um, you know, we, we have offices in, in Pennsylvania, Florida, and, um, you know, in, in New Jersey, but it, we practice in all areas of the country. And one of the things that I, uh, I find this to be so relevant for is because when you're in a urban area, particularly in an urban area, I should say, you find yourself that you find out that you could be next to a property owner who might not have taken your building into account when they are either demoing their building, doing any type of construction. So we frequently see that. Um, and that could cause serious damage. Uh, it could cause serious, da serious damage, which requires uh, urgent attention. And we see this in the news. In, in, in Philadelphia, there was the Salvation Army collapse um, which was, was horrible. And, and also the South Florida collapse, which was horrible. Um, so we know that when the foundation is disrupted, it's something that you need to take seriously. And um, unfortunately, you know, your own insurance company is oftentimes not going to step up to the plate. You're going to have to actually go after the neighboring properties uh, insurance policy if they have one. Um, so that's frequently something you see in, in, in city areas, whether that's a fire, whether that's, like I said, demolition that occurs and they didn't properly, the architect who was designing the plans or the, the people doing the construction, the construction didn't properly take into account your sacred place, which is next to it when they demoed it. That happens often. Um, this is also to say, uh, there, and, and also to stress the importance of, you know, these negligence claims that arise when you hire your own contractors. I mean, oftentimes people, I find that people will hire bad contractors. They won't, um, who'll, make a, who'll make a bad situation worse. And the problem is, is that certain things are covered by your insurance policy and certain things aren't. Negligence is typically not covered. Another person's negligence when it comes to construction is not typically covered by your insurance company. So you really have to unfortunately go after them. Unlike some of these other topics that we're talking about where you may or may not um, have the decision of whether to get a public adjuster or an attorney to advocate on your behalf. This is one of those is issues where it's, it's important to get an attorney early on. They analyze your policy, let you know um, where it is that the payments are going to come from and which parties to go after to make sure that um, you know you're 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 covered. Uh, moving on to the next slide, the next topic here. This is one that we could spend an entire lecture on ourselves, uh, and something that we do. A lot of the work we do, uh, you know, comes from comes after I should say, you know, a major catastrophic event. And unfortunately, we've seen a huge uptick in these events. In, in, in the last few years. Um, just, just to put it into perspective, the hurricane season typically be, began, begins on June 1st and will end on November 30th. Um, so during that time, you know, you have uh, typically, and, and from 1981 to 2010, there's been an average of 12.1 name storms with 6.4 hurricanes and 2.7 major hurricanes. To date, we have 20 named storms, uh, tying it with 1933 as the third uh, as the third most active Atlantic hurricane season on record. Um, the storms have caused just under about 70 billion dollars in damages, which is a staggering statistic, and, and it hasn't ended. I mean, we still have we still have uh, the month of November here. Um, so why is this important? It's important because when you experience damage in a 
hurricane or wildfire or you know in, in, in the west flooding it's 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 super important to be proactive in these matters um, and that's because these these insurance companies get overwhelmed and they're looking for any reason to deny people they're looking for any reason to shortchange people and they're looking to do that because quite frankly they are if, if you're not pushing the case forward it's not going to move they're going to have these adjusters will have stacks of cases in front of them so it's important to document things early and to really get in the face of your adjuster and have someone do that for you who knows your policy and knows what you'd be entitled to um, you know, we have about 100 and or so claims still from uh, Hurricane Michael, and we were shocked. I mean, the level of devastation when we went down there, it was like looking at, and this is in Florida, the level of devastation down there it was like an apocalyptic movie being on the set. Uh, houses blown off the pylons, uh, trees split in half, and, and these insurance adjusters, uh, you know, were coming into people's houses and saying the damage was due to neglect and wear and tear. I mean, that just gives you an idea of some of the things we saw. Um, so it's incredibly important to be proactive there. Uh, also, one, the the, one of the, the most outrageous ones was a uh, pre-existing condition of the foundation for the house yeah, that was completely I mean, torn up. I, I walked into a, a living room that had a hole in the center of it uh, and water had been pouring into this person's, this, this poor, poor family's house. And uh, the insurance adjuster said, well, you know, they didn't upkeep their building and because they didn't upkeep their building, you know, that their, their, I think it was their siding. This, this is what led to this damage. I mean, ridiculous. So again, this is why it's super important to be proactive. It's actually very important to be proactive in all of these cases because, uh, and, and you know, that's what this slide particularly highlights is, is that when you see something to really be able to document it through pictures and, and to instantly try and connect with either an adjuster or, a, um, or, or, or an attorney, or somebody who can advise you as to your policy, and to get in there and to help you start mitigating your damages, hire the, uh, get contractors, get uh, potentially engineers if there are issues with your, you know, the structure of your building, super, super important. Um, and, you know, that, that's a good segue also into the statute of limitations, which is why it's so important to be um, proactive in these cases. Uh, Greg? Yeah, thanks, Austin. All right, so a statute of limitations, what is it? Why do you care? Well, you know, why is it important? Uh, the statute of limitations is set by your state. Um, so it could be two years, could be five years, um, could be somewhere in between. And, and what it is, it is your time, your time, your deadline to bring a lawsuit against your insurance company. And if you do not bring a lawsuit within that particular statute of limitations, you lose your right to do it forever, forever. Uh, if you're a day late, too bad. Um, so that's very important. And that's important, you know, when you're looking, you should know what it is, but you should really know what it is when a event happens, a loss event happens, you know, make a checklist and just have that on the calendar to say, and even calendar 60 days before that and say, okay, here's my statute of limitations. Um, very important. And, uh, you know, speak with an attorney, public adjuster should know, a good public adjuster should know as well. Um, something also important, and this is one of the reasons that we suggest that you get an advocate that's helping you with your claim. Uh, there are limitations and deadlines set by your policy. Each policy is different. Uh, they may contain different deadlines, um, different limitations. But for instance, uh, I think I spoke about it earlier, you have a certain amount of time to report your claim. And if you don't report the claim, they're gonna deny you and say, well, you didn't report the claim uh, enough, uh, soon enough. Uh, another deadline would be uh, to fill out what's called a proof of loss, which is a form that uh, looks like it's written in different language that you really don't understand what it means, nor you may not have the capability to fill it out, but the insurance company still expects it. Um, those are just two of the, the things that I see a lot that, you know, we go to, we go to suit, uh, you know, I'm litigating a ton of Hurricane Michael claims 
And uh, I have one one particular case where uh, I'm really dug in. It's a it's a family, and the wife signed the proof of loss. It needs to be signed and notarized. So she did it. Um, the husband didn't do it, but they're both named on the insurance policy. And the insurance company is now saying that because the husband didn't sign it, that they don't have a claim. They didn't comply with the policy. We're denying coverage just because there's not a signature there. So just to give you an idea of, of how, I don't want to use the word petty, but, but petty, um, these insurance policies or, and adjusters can be uh, and how detailed for the average person. I mean, I'm looking at them and some of them are 60 pages. And if you go into a, a, a sacred place policy, whew, I mean, you, you need a decoder ring to, to understand some of the provisions um, and how they work. So very important that you're familiar with your policy. Someone knows what they're talking about, can explain it, review it for you et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the questions we got during our last webinar was, well, how are we supposed to pay for this? Are we supposed to hire an attorney to review our policy uh, with us? And the answer to that question is a good attorney um, or a good public adjuster would value speaking with you prior to a claim for free and would be happy to review your policy for free. Um, you know, if it becomes a, an everyday type of thing, uh, that's a different story. But if you're saying, hey, you know, can you look at my policy and just tell me if there's, you know, if everything uh, looks in line with, with what it should be, or are there any things I should know uh, in the policy? Or can you explain what this provision means to me? You know, a good attorney is going to say, sure, I'd, I'd love to. And they're not going to charge you because they want to develop a relationship with you. Same thing with an adjuster, uh, because they know if they uh, spend the time and provide a service to you that when something does happen, that you're gonna reach out to them. So definitely encourage you to, uh, to reach out. If you need certain suggestions, uh, if it's not an area that we cover, you know, we, as Austin said, we litigate all over the country. So we've developed partnerships with various law firms, um, seeing a lot of Texas uh, happening here. And, you know, we have a, a sister firm uh, in Texas, uh, in Houston, that we work with on these types of claims. So if, if there's any questions uh, about how we can refer you to qualified individuals in your area, just, just let us know, we're happy to do it. Okay, so uh, we're gonna touch, and I've kind of already hit some of these things, but we're gonna talk about the advocating, um, what we do, uh, how we do it, why we do it, why you should uh, hire uh, an advocate or work with an advocate. And I'll talk a little bit about how the advocates get paid once uh, a claim is, is at issue. But um, this is about insurance adjusters. Uh, Austin talked about an independent adjuster. I, I love that term. Um, they're not independent at all. Uh, they work for the insurance company. I mean, point blank period. Um, some are good people. Uh, I, have, I have friends that are independent adjusters. Some are qualified people. They know what they're doing. Some have no idea. I mean, literally no idea, especially, especially when there's a hurricane or some sort of cat event and, you know, State Farm or Allstate, you know, they, they bring people in from out of state, they bust them in. And these are people that they, you know, especially now with, with the, some of the labor shortages, they're hiring people that have no experience, maybe took an online course and now they're walking around uh, sacred places, they're walking around commercial structures trying to evaluate it for a loss. And, and they're, they're necessary, but they're not the people you want dictating how to fix your property. Um, you, you need somebody that's looking out for your interests. Uh, and we'll go into some examples of, of what that, you know, it's worth its weight in gold for whatever you'd spend on those people. Um, So I said it, insurance companies naturally try to, uh, to limit payouts. I, I have a, um, a good friend of mine actually is a state farm broker and he's in my weekly networking group. And uh, he gave a presentation this past week. And one of his things uh, was talking about state farm and how state farm hit the corporate, hit all their profit goals and they're now the largest. Um, and they've you know, hit these shareholder goals. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, yeah. 
That's because they're collecting premiums and they're not paying out claims. Um, and, and we look at that versus, you know, who, who, who do you as uh, custodians of the sacred places, who do you have working for you? Um, you know, who's handling these claims? Is it the pastor? Uh, is it a board? Is it a volunteer? Is it another member of clergy? Is that what they should be doing? Do they have the, the requisite skill, knowledge? Uh, and even if they do, is their time spent uh, better doing what they should be doing? Um, something, to, something to think about, and it's not, it's not a, uh, a negative point that they're not insurance experts. They shouldn't be. Um, you know, they should focus on what they do and what they do for the community, not on making sure the engineer's coming and uh, writing a cause and origin report. It's, it's a job left to somebody else. So just to kind of think about the uneven, there's an uneven balance. You know, the insurance company, they have teams of people. As I said, they bust people in, they have teams of lawyers, they have teams of adjusters, uh, of adjusters and you know they may seem uh, like uh, I think I think it was Mark said that that they're not getting back to them. Well, I would submit to you that that's by design. Um, they want to delay this thing as long as possible. They want to wear people out. That's what they do. There's a famous book and whoever whoever's nerdy enough that wants to look it up uh, on Amazon. It was written by I think a former Allstate executive. It's called Delay deny, delay, deny. And it just talks about the insurance company's overall strategy of uh, from a, a psychological perspective about how they process claims and why they do it the way they do it. So uh, moving on to denial, a uh, common question we get and we, we got it last, uh, the last webinar we did was, well, my claim was already denied. I already went through it myself. Uh, it was denied. Do I have any recourse? And the answer to that question, which the famous lawyer answer, which is, it depends. Um, you have to look at the policy. We have to see what was submitted. Uh, there are other options. You can resubmit. You can ask for reconsideration based on new facts. Uh, again, you'd have to meet all those dead policy deadlines and restrictions. The other thing that uh, is a possibility, depending on your policy, is an, an appraisal. Uh, and an appraisal, like Austin uh, explains a little bit, or I'll, I'll just touch on it a little bit more, um, each side appoints a neutral appraiser. Those appraisers choose a umpire. And essentially, I don't want to say it's a court hearing, but it's a mini, hey, uh, the sacred place, we believe uh, we've suffered a million dollars worth of damage. Uh, the insurance companies say, hey, the damage is really around the 100000 100, Umpire make a decision on what it really is. And sometimes uh, sometimes damages can be decided like that. We, we like to steer people that way if we think it's a good fit because litigation should always be a last resort. We know people, uh, particularly congregations, don't want to sue. Uh, and I, I tell, you know, I tell my individual uh, clients that, look, that this is your last option. Uh, and let's, let's try to jump through every hoop. Let's try to uh, dot every I and cross every T. And then if worse comes to worst, we have to do what we have to do. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Austin. I do see there's uh, some questions happening as well. Thanks, Greg. And actually, I think, uh, Rachel was going to speak on this slide here just a little bit about um, the success we've had with sacred places in the past. Um, Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to get into many, many church buildings. I was actually thinking about this today. I was like, over 10 years, how many church buildings do I think I've been in? Hundreds or thousands? I was going between the two trying to figure it out. Um, my point is, it's a lot. And these guys trained me on what to look for. So I know what to look for visually. I know what to listen for when I talk to congregations to figure out whether or not um, it might make sense for them to get in touch with somebody like Austin and Greg and pursue a claim or not. Um, over that relationship, we have helped congregations recover hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and in some of the cases, I can confidently say that that money made the difference between the congregation being able to remain in their building and or not. So yeah, it's been really great. 
Thanks, Rachel. So, you know, uh, just as a quick overview, and this is getting into the maximize section, and, and you know, um, there we, we can't stress enough uh, trusting the process here, trusting the process of uh, when it is to get an advocate and, and how it is to let them, what, what the process looks like. And Greg, the next slide. So this is just a little bit of what the process looks like altogether is just a recap. Again, it's important that early on you inspect the property, the, the, the loss, the damage is documented, it's analyzed by a professional. So a good public adjuster, a good attorney, this is what they're going to do. Um, they're going to come in, they're going to make sure that with your help that it's documented, that it's analyzed, that that right experts are are put on the job, uh, contractors, engineers, um, to write up estimates of what's needed. Uh, report and mitigate damage. I always get the question, how are we to mitigate the damages in our building if we're not getting paid? It's, it's uh, you, you know, obviously that's that's a huge problem that people run into. And that's, that's a place where uh, insurance companies try to jam people up. Oh, well, you didn't mitigate. Well, you didn't pay me. A good public adjuster or a good attorney who knows, um, who basically knows what they're doing is going to tell the insurance companies to tender the undisputed amount. So in other words, the, the, we don't agree to the overall amount where you're, you, you might be paying, but you know, for the amount you say, uh, there, we, we can agree that there was $10,000 of damage, at least $10,000 of damage. I want you to give that to my client immediately. Um, and that helps at least get mitigation started, whether that's tarping, whether that's having an emergency services crew out there, whether you have an allocation of money that's uh, devoted to emergency services, uh, depending on your policy. That's important uh, for you know, a public adjuster or an attorney to point out to you. So getting really the right experts out there who are also going to quantify the damages through uh, reports. They're going to say, okay, well, this needs to be replaced. And if they know the policy, they're going to look for things like debris removal. Um, you know, who's going to pay for the debris removal? Who's going to pay to have little things that can add up costing a ton of money? Who's going to pay to inventory the items? Who's going to pay to make sure that there's dumpsters that are brought in and that are they're paid for? That's not an, a, an, a, an added expense that's incurred by the insured. All of those little things add up. Um, and a public adjuster step five is going to meet with, with the independent adjuster. They're going to try and see if they can reach a negotiation. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to try and see if they can reach uh, some sort of point where, you know, both parties agree and, if, and, and settle the claim. I mean, that's the goal almost all of the time in, you know, for a public adjuster or for an attorney that's evaluating these claims who knows what they're doing. Because litigation is a last resort. Um, you know, there are certain circumstances where we'll get a feel for them and we'll say, okay, you know, these the, the, the insurance company is being completely unreasonable. Or if you feel that you're getting denied on a denial situation, as Greg covered, um, and we go in and we look at the policy and we see that it's clearly the denial is, is based on false facts. Uh, that's when we'll just bring a lawsuit um, in those situations. Uh, or we could try to, if the policy allows for it, trigger an appraisal like we discussed, um, which is usually at times a quicker, uh, more, a, a quicker, cleaner way to, uh, get, the, to get the case resolved. Uh, and, it, and it will also drive down costs. So that's really what the process should look like. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people come to us after there's an issue or long into uh, the process, you know, they'll come to us a year out. And then we have to, you know, really start taking a look at what it was that they did, analyzing their policy. But oftentimes, you know, we find that if as long as you're within, within the timing situation, you can, you can still go back, rewrite estimates, and you can still uh, get a good result. So just a case study just to show kind of one, one of those results as an example. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, uh, we're always asked, well, my uh, congregation, my sacred place, we can't afford an attorney, we can't afford a public adjuster. 
good attorneys, good public adjusters, they're paid on contingency, just kind of like you see in uh, those commercials for attorneys where it's, we don't get paid unless you get paid. Well, that's the situation here. Um, so they get paid a percent of the recovery. And then, you know, some people will say, well, is it even worth it at that point? You know, am I going to have enough to fix the church? Well, this is a uh, just a case study of one a sacred place that we um, were brought in to handle the claim after they were denied. So we saw that they were denied. We took a look at their policy and the reason for being denied. And of course, that, that term came up wear and tear. So we found um, a qualified, we, we were taking a look at who they used. Uh, an expert, in my opinion, didn't know what they were doing, was not familiar with the complicated masonry and the, the, the roof that was on the sacred place. So we hired the right architects who had uh, and, and engineers that had a lot of experience. Um, and we highlighted why it was that they shouldn't be denied. They reopened the claim. Uh, the insurance company reopened the claim. They sent somebody out to estimate, to, to put it together an estimate of the original damage that, that led to them coming up with a $41,000 amount. At that point, you know, we didn't agree to the, that being uh, the amount to settle the claim, but we said, okay, tender that $41,000 so they can begin construction. And that's exactly what we did. The second estimate came in after we pointed out to them, well, you're not accounting for the following things. You're, you're, you're not matching on the roof, as we said before, um, you know, earlier on in the presentation. So the second estimate, they went out and they, they, they accounted for the matching and it came out to $192,000. And again, here was another situation, another place where we said, you know, no, we're not agreeing that that's the final amount here, but you can tender that amount. And We'll, we'll, we'll have our, our uh, client begin to start uh, to, fur to get further along in the process of fixing their property, and they did. And in the meantime, we also pointed out some other areas of coverage, like I said before, and were, which all led to a final set of settlement of $268,000, uh, 554% more than you know, the original estimate. So there you go. I, I mean, that, that's just one example of a case that was a recent case, but somebody who knows what they're doing has been doing this for a while can very much add value to uh, the claims process. Um, and just as I touched on here, you know, we got, we're, we're able to go from a denial to $268,000. We were able to, the, our, our client was able to make the necessary repairs and really ensure that, and, and secure the structure. So that, that was a win. And, and it's frequently the the situation we find ourselves in really going in and arguing for people who are just trying to get their insurance companies to respond to them properly and give them the, what they're entitled to under their policy. Um, so here are just a few other examples of cases that, you know, we handled where we were brought in and you could see uh, without being the original estimate that was given and the value add. Um, which is why it's tremendously I, th I think the numbers speak for themselves It's tremendously important to get the right advocate who's going to be in as early in the process as possible and, and, and start putting you in touch with the right uh, you know, contractors, engineers, and really making sure to, that the uh, insurance companies have their feet held to the fire. Because if they don't, you're going, as, as an attorney or an, an attorney that you may hire will be able to bring a bad faith claim. Uh, a bad faith claim is whenever an insurance company does not negotiate in good faith, you're able to ask, uh, you're able to sue on the basis of a bad faith claim. And in certain states, that has punitive damages that attach to it and, and attorney's fees. So it's a real tool of getting them to, uh, really getting them to, to come to the table. And so, you know, again, we, our goal here tonight has really been to, uh, you know, give you guys some education, some background, um, and why it is important to hire a professional um, when the moment you see damage. So, it, you know, we're, we're happy to answer any questions. We're going to open up um, the, you know, the chat again to questions to see if, if we didn't answer something that you guys had already posed. Um, or if you would like to reach out to us individually, we're going to give you, you know, our contact information and you can do so. And we'll be happy to speak with you directly. Uh, about whatever situation you're going through. Um, if, I, so. if I could just jump in real quick. Um, 
you know, uh, a public adjuster, their standard fee should be 10%. So if, if you meet with a public adjuster and they're charging more, usually a red flag, um, you know, usually to me, it's, well, you know, everyone else charges 10%, you're charging 25%. It doesn't make sense. So 10% is something you should be looking for, for just the, the standard public adjuster. Uh, encourage you to ask them what their experience is um, with sacred places, with historical structures. Uh, encourage you to ask for references um, because as much as there are a lot of, you know, just like people, there's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of bad people. There's a lot of good attorneys. There's a lot of bad attorneys. There's a lot of good public adjusters. There's a lot of bad ones. So make sure you vet them. Uh, make sure, you know, they know their stuff. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about also was uh, personal property uh, and what's included in the church. And uh, that's that could be a whole other webinar and how do you value historic artifacts? Uh, you know, how does, how does your insurance policy value it? So, you know, just something to think about Definitely encourage everyone to check with their broker. Uh, a, is your policy sufficient? Does does the ha, has the building structure increased throughout the years for the cost to replace? Because right now, uh, construction materials labor, forget about it. Uh, it, it is it's increased uh, by I think it's roughly twenty two percent, something like that. So check with your brokers. Make sure you have sufficient coverage for what it's going to cost to uh, repair, replace, make sure or, or check to see if you have flood insurance. Uh, and if you don't, how much it's going to cost you and whether you need it. Um, and uh, I wanna just address some questions first. Uh, Gladys uh, from Philadelphia asked a, a question uh, regarding a, a water leak that she's having. She says that the, the church spent 52,000 uh, out of pocket. Um, Gladys, I'll be happy to talk to you if you have some time tomorrow. Uh, I'm happy to speak with you. Uh, it's very hard. Each every claim is different, so it's very hard for me to give a generalized uh, advice or answer to that question. Something sounds fishy to me. I, I mean, particularly when a, a a client pays out of pocket, it's kind of proof that it was damaged, and this is how much it cost to fix it, and they should pay it. I, I I'm not sure uh, exactly why. Uh, why or why not they didn't pay it, but I'd be happy to speak with you tomorrow. I'll put my information in, in the chat and uh, I, I think Sacred Places is gonna send out some contact, uh, a contact email for us as well. And just, uh, you can email me, call me, just reference that uh, you were in the webinar and I'll be happy to speak with you tomorrow about it. Um, uh, and we're also question. gonna be providing you guys with a, a checklist of what to do uh, in the event of a, you know, a, an oncoming catastrophic event. So if you see that there's a hurricane, it's a checklist of, of, of what, what you should do, what steps you should take. And I see that R Randolph asked the question, do public adjusters require a contract? Yes, they do. Um, oh. And that's why you should, you should, you should read it. I think they, they're required to have a contract. And if they don't, that's another red flag. Austin, what were you going to say? I, I was going to say it depends what state you're in. Um, generally, you know, I, I agree that you know they are required to have a contract, but in some states, you're you're not even allowed to, uh, as a public adjuster, like I said, negotiate on behalf of the insured. So they shouldn't even really be giving you a contract. Um, it's the in some states, it's the attorneys that will do the quote unquote public adjusting. They they are the ones who are able to negotiate with the insurance companies. And if you're not satisfied, you can fire your public adjuster. Um, it doesn't mean they won't be entitled to anything, but you can you can switch public adjusters just like you can switch attorneys, um, and they you know will be compensated uh, percentage wise. You won't have to pay them uh, out of pocket, but they'll still be entitled to you know if they adjust the claim and let's say they got because we actually a lot of our business comes from public adjusters. Um, that get to a point where they get a certain amount of money on a claim and they can't do anything else because they, there's really no teeth. Um, or, or from situations where people aren't happy with their public adjusters because they've uh, hired them and they haven't, they never saw them again. And yeah, uh, or you know, they got the they quick, us yeah, they, they got the quick, you know, the public adjuster gets the, you know, the icing um, or, or gets the low hanging fruit and then says, oh, sorry, you know, I got my 10 grand, not much more I can do. Uh, good public adjuster, ask them, ask them if they have engineers they work with. Are they going to bring in the engineers? Are they going to pay for the engineers? Who, what engineers do they work with? 
Do they have experience with historic buildings? You know, all things you want to ask these people. And, and you know, quite frankly, as I said, a good public adjuster, a good attorney is going to welcome this conversation. Um, they're not going to charge you for it. And they're going to want to build a relationship with you. So it looks like that's all the questions. Any, any other questions, concerns? I'm going to put my information here. All you're right. Well, gonna, thank you're also going to get our information, like like uh, I said, and it's going to be sent around to everybody. And um, so, so, thank you, everybody, and thank you yeah, thank again, you. Sacred Places, for for having us here and giving us the ability to to you know hopefully educate everybody and answer some questions here. Um, and again, just really do not hesitate to reach out to us if if you're having a an issue. We can put you in touch with the right people. Thanks, guys. Thank you.